thesis examiner, the, uh, the internal thesis examiner, Professor Patrick Johansson. Hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, then we turn over to uh, the people on link. So then we switch to the uh, yep. to the Zoom window. Just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, first of all, we have the uh, faculty opponent for the dissertation, uh, Professor Ehrenfried uh, Sech. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, 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 Ehrenfried is uh, 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 from the Department of Microelectronic and Materials and Nanoanalysis uh, at the Fraunhofer Institute for Ceramic Technologies and Systems in Germany. We're very pleased that you could take on this, uh, this uh, uh, very important uh, uh, duty for the department. Thank you very much. I'm not sure which way I'm going to turn now to the camera or to the screen here, but I guess I'm going to turn to the camera. <laughs> So thank you very much for, for taking on this important role. Uh, then we have uh, uh, a, um, uh, the uh, examination committee as well. Uh, we have uh, three, three uh, professors, uh, Professor Reina Wallenberg from the Centrum, uh, Cent uh, Center for Analysis and Synthesis, maybe I translate now from Swedish, at Lund University. Uh, Reina, can you? Wave your hand, maybe. Great, thank you. We have Professor uh, Uta Clement from the uh, 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 the Division for Industry and Material Science. Maybe that was the wrong translation. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And we have Professor Klaus uh, Leifer from the uh, Department of Material Science at Uppsala University. This way. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And then we have a a, a um, what do you say? Suppliant. Uh, Suppliant. Uh, uh, in case any of you ordinary uh, uh, members of the committee would be blocked out from the video link, uh, Martin Andersson, professor at the Department of Chemistry and uh, and. Uh, uh, Chemistry, chemical engineering, chemical engineering at Chalmers will then um, step in. No. Okay. And so you're actually quite close. You're just across the, uh, the other building here. So you can run here if, you, if you're blocked out, I think. Uh, then I should also add that we have, some, uh, we have three, um, three assistant supervisors uh, to Cecilia's uh, thesis work. Uh, it is uh, uh, Professor Niklas Loreen from uh, uh, RISE, the Research Institute of Sweden. You waved your hand, very good. We have Professor uh, Ayla Serke from, uh, from the Mathematical Department here at Chalmers. And we have uh, Professor Christian from, uh, from Course 1 from AstraZeneca. Very good. Uh, so, uh, so the thesis uh, uh, um, defense will uh, uh, go like this. So we'll, first we will have a, a about 10 minute presentation from the uh, faculty opponent, uh, Professor uh, Czech, Czech, uh who will uh, put the thesis in, a, in, in context. And then uh, Cecilia will present the main points of her thesis uh, in a presentation for about 40 minutes. Now we'll take a short break, five minute break. And uh, after that, we come back here and it's time for uh, the uh, question uh, session or the discussion part where uh, the faculty opponent uh, discuss with Cecilia. Uh, after that, the thesis committee will step in and give their comments and questions. And after that, uh, the, uh, the uh, audience uh, who can also be present uh, anywhere and just see this on, on uh, YouTube can step in and, and send questions. And we will come back to how exactly that's going to be, be done later on. Uh, now, I'm not sure if I've forgotten anything, most probably. Sorry? Yes, the question is now, Cecilia, do you have uh, any errors in your thesis? No. 
No, fantastic. So, <laughs> no errata list. Okay. So with that, I think I will uh, we will switch over to uh, uh, to uh, Professor Sech, uh, who will give this introduction to the thesis subject. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, hello to Cecilia and to hello to all. It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to be opponent in this uh, defense of the PhD thesis. I have to say that I'm as nervous as Cecilia because it's for me the first time that I'm opponent uh, at a university in Sweden and the procedure is a little bit different than in Germany, but I'm expecting we will make it. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure, but unfortunately, and uh, that's a pity, I'm not able to come to you. So, but I decided to come a little bit into the direction Göteborg from Dresden. I'm now in my holiday house at the Baltic Sea. So it's about halfway. Um, I will try to share my presentation. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> what I would like to do shortly, I would like to say some words about the research field. Um, however, I would like to connect it with uh, original contributions that uh, are presented here in this uh, PhD thesis. So the research field uh, we are focused on here is materials characterization. And if you look on the scheme on the left hand side, then you can see that materials characterization and testing and modeling are very closely connected to a manufactured product. And this is one part, but on the other hand, it's very complex because Materials characterization provides information about the materials. Usually we have a look to the micro and nanostructure of the materials and get information about the properties and the functionality of the material, which is um, closely connected to the material processing. You see that it is a very complex uh, system and materials characterization always requires a good understanding of a lot of disciplines. And at the same time, it's a very interdisciplinary task. In this PhD thesis, and this I enjoyed very much, the whole chain of sample so from the starting with the sample selection through sample preparation, data acquisition, but also the interpretation of the results, the whole chain is covered for a special group of porous materials. Now I would like to describe uh, the research field. The research field of materials characterization includes uh, materials and sample selection. Here, this is coding for controlled drug release. Then uh, sample preparation, oops, uh, of soft, porous, non-conducting materials. Here done with focused ion beam. Then data acquisition of soft, porous, non-conducting materials. Here scanning electron microscopy. And then advanced data analysis, here quantitative 3D reconstruction and determination of parameters, mainly your transport parameters also of the porous materials and the interpretation of the results with correlation of 3D morphology with the properties of the porous materials. So from my point of view, this research field for this PhD thesis was well selected and it is not too narrow for a PhD thesis. The PhD thesis has addressed a very challenging topic, which is uh, of topical interest currently, 
from two points of view. One from fundamental research, which includes the quantitative 3D characterization of porous or skeleton materials. And from industry, the coating for controlled drug release, but with a high potential for a much broader field of applications. I see two major fields of original contributions in diseases. Of course, there are much more, but I would like to uh, mention two fields um, that, uh, from my point of view, are most important. This is one is the sample preparation and data acquisition of soft pores and non-conducting materials. And second one is advanced data analysis and the interpretation of the results. Now, let's uh, start for, with the first point, the uh, sample preparation and data acquisition. Um, this uh, serial sectioning technique that is applied in this work includes sample preparation using focused ion beam and data acquisition in the scanning electron microscope of soft porous and non-conducting materials. What is state of the art? I think focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy are well-established techniques. Serial sectioning technique is also known for decades. It's a well-established technique, and it's also commercially available. The original result that I see in this PhD thesis is the development of a procedure or recipe for the preparation of soft, porous, that means also beam-sensitive, and non-conducting materials. The, there's an additional achievement. This is the demonstration of the performance and applicability of the new TESCAN SEM FIP system, including the tomography software for high quality focus ion beam SEM studies, including the serial sectioning for porous and uh, non-conducting samples. The second uh, major original contribution is an advanced data analysis and which is focused on the quantitative 3D reconstruction and the determination of uh, parameters of porous materials and the interpretation of results, the correlation uh, of the 3D morphology with properties, including transport properties of porous materials. So state of the art is this 3D reconstruction based on a series of 2D images from serial sectioning. This is established. But usually qualitative description of the 3D morphology of materials and systems is done. The original results that I see is the development of a procedure that allows to determine parameters, for instance, uh, tortuosity, and uh, correlate this with transport properties the, uh, that describe the 3D morphology of porous materials. And uh, particularly the poor interconnectivity quantitatively. That's the difference, the quantitative description. And second, uh, correlation of the effective diffusion coefficient with the experimentally measured permeability. There is an additional achievement that I would like to mention. It's a demonstration of the advantage application of artificial intelligence algorithms, for instance, in uh, segmentation and in the, uh, in the selection of metrics and uh, pores. Uh, in the last two pages, I would like to mention that from my point of view, this PhD thesis has uh, provided an important step in our field of science, in material science, but also connected with physics, chemistry. And I would like to mention the impact on future research and innovation. On this page, the fundamental research, the achievement, is a high quality serial sectioning approach and 3D reconstruction uh, of uh, samples from uh, non conducting materials. And uh, here it uh, was demonstrated that it is possible to mitigate the damage and the charging 
caused by ions and electrons. And uh, I see several potential impact factors on future research. Here are only some examples. I think uh, it will help for further developments and procedures uh, for, um, for uh, focused ion beam sample preparation and SEM imaging of beam sensitive and poorly conducting materials, parameter optimization. Then I see further development of models for fluid dynamic processes and diffusion in porous and skeletal materials. Next, a broader application of artificial intelligence algorithms, machine learning, and also the application of inverse methods. And I see also this PhD thesis as a basis for further correlative microscopy on different length scales. And <clears throat> this was for fundamental research, but there is also a strong impact on applied research and development. So it could achieve a quantitative description of the 3D morphology of the porous materials, and uh, which is important for the determination of quantitative parameters for fluid dynamic modeling. Uh, modeling. And this was uh, demonstrated for a phase separated polymer film coating for controlled drug release for pharmaceutical industry. However, I see that uh, this knowledge will definitely have impact on other uh, applications, and there are much more than I mentioning here, but this is my personal view where I convinced that uh, this these results will have an impact. It's for microelectronics because it's uh, necessary to understand the topology of uh, pores and porous dielectric materials that are insulators between metal interconnects and microchips. Then in geology, uh, it is important for oil extraction from sediments and uh, for gas, for instance, carbon dioxide storage in sediments, that's also connected to fluid dynamics or the basis for fluid dynamic models. Then in energy technology, um, this knowledge can be used for uh, design and optimization of porous electrode materials for batteries and fuel cells. And last but not least, I would like to mention biomimetics and hydrogen technologies. Um, to describe hierarchically structured biological systems and uh, systems for energy conversion that in future also will be built up in a hierarchical way. So uh, this was uh, my presentation to summarize uh, from uh, my personal point of view uh, this PhD thesis and the original results and bring them into the context of the research field of materials characterization and broader also to material science, physics and chemistry. Thank you, Professor Fred. Uh, now we turn over to Cecilia, who will present her main points of the thesis. All right, I give the floor to you, Cecilia. Thank you so much. Uh, let's do it like this. And we do. Sorry, this is working. Good. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation, Professor Ehrenfried. I really enjoyed it. Um, see, Cecilia, sorry, we still see Professor Ehrenfield's uh, okay, presentation thank you for on the Zoom. Now we see you. Good. Hi. <laughs> thank you. Hey. <laughs> okay. Do are you also see my screen now? Right? No? Or didn't I start sharing? Let's see here. Okay, just a second. Get fix the camera. And where's the? 
Where's the meeting? Okay. Share a screen, maybe. Am I not in the meeting or? No. And you can see me? And then we start the camera. But I can't, um, I mean, it's, to me it looks like. Pressing this back to meeting. Sorry? This orange back to meeting. Here, great. And now I have to adjust the camera, just a second. Someone's phone is here. Okay. Um, then I take share screen and share. So can you all see me and you can see my shared screen and hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Let's start here then. If this one could work. Um, I have to restart it. Let's do like this and laser pointer. Now it works, finally. So yes, uh, the title of my PhD thesis that I'm um, defending here today is Quantitative 3D Reconstruction of Porous Polymers Using Thebsem Tomography and Correlating Material Structures to Properties of Coatings for Controlled Drug Release. So let's jump straight away into what is controlled drug release then. So to most of you, this is probably a familiar product here. This is a capsule. And inside this capsule, there's a lot of small blue particles here, and these are called pellets. So let's take a closer look at one of these pellets then. In the middle here, you have a microcrystalline cellulose core, and we coat that one with a drug layer, as you can see here. And in order to control, uh, to control the drug release from this uh, drug layer, we can coat with a phase separated polymer film, which you see here in blue. So I'm playing a little animation for you here so you can see that the structure inside these coatings are used as the transport path for the drugs. If we take a look over here then, we can see that we have the drug concentration in the blood plasma versus time. We also have three different ranges. So we have an ineffective range when we don't get the treatment from the drug that we want. We also have a therapeutic range where we get the optimal treatment from the drug and also a toxic range where we don't want to be. And there's different release mechanisms uh, systems. So we have immediate release. It is when you take one dosage and it's released into our body and you enter the therapeutic range, range and then you dip down again. And then you need another dose. And then you enter the therapeutic range again and then you dip down and you need another one and so on. However, if we then use controlled drug release, we take one dosage at the beginning, and then we release the drug into the body during uh, a period of time in the optimal treatment range. How do we then create these coatings? So as you see down here, then we have the pellet. So it is the core in the middle and the uh, coating. And this coating consists of ethyl cellulose, which we denote from now on as EC, and that's a water insoluble polymer. And we mix it with the hydroxypropyl cellulose, which it is denoted as HPC, and that is a water soluble polymer. However, if you want to mix a water soluble and water insoluble polymer, you need, for example, in our case, we use ethanol as the solvent. And then we get the polymer phase separation. And depending on the content of the ethanol, we are either in the one phase where we have the polymer solution, 
or when ethanol is starting to evaporate, we're entering this two-phase region. And that's where we start to form this bicontinuous structure in the coatings. If we then take this pellet and put it into our mouth, it occurs a leaching process. And that is how we create the transport, um, the transport path by leaching out the water-soluble polymer, HPC. There are different factors affecting the release properties from these types of EC and HPC films. And one that is presented by um, previous work then performed by Maria Grazia and her colleagues are the amount of added HPC to the polymer film. And to the, on the y-axis here, you can see that we have water permeability versus x-axis, which is the content of HPC in the films. And I want to drag your attention to when we have around 30, uh, sorry, 20 weight percent of HPC in the films, then we have low water permeability. However, if we increase up to 30% HPC content in the films, we have higher water permeability. So from this previous work, we see that an onset of permeability. So an increasing water permeability with increasing HPC content. Other previous work have shown, for example, 3D reconstructions of soft pores and poorly conductive materials. However, uh, extensive sample preparations have been used. For example, staining the samples to uh, make the sample more conductive using, for example, metals, filling up the pores using, for example, pore fillers, or freeze the samples, uh, then it's called cryo. Pore size and pore morphology me measurements are frequently used as characterization for porous networks. However, these do not capture crucial structural features that actually can impact uh, transport properties. And also, previous work uh, have had two core spatial resolution of the 3D data, which then results in uh, big deviations if you compare then the simulated data with, um, with measured, experimentally measured data. This work then presents acquisition of high spatial resolution 3D data using minimum sample preparation. Also a methodology to identify stru uh, crucial structural features in the porous network that then can impact mass transport properties. And then simulate sim uh, transport properties using our high special 3D data, which then results in good correlation between the 3D material structures to transport properties. If we take a more detailed look here on the scope of my work, we correlate structures in soft porous materials to transport properties. So in order to do this, I started out first to visualize the structures in 3D, the structure then in the coatings. So um, if we then take a porous and poorly conductive material and put it into the FibSAM, uh, there might occur some challenges due to charging or, uh, for example, charging due to um, the electrons and the ions. So the first step was to develop a protocol in order to reduce these artifacts. And for that, I optimized ion beam milling parameters as well as uh, the electron beam imaging parameters. And as I told you, we used a minimal sample preparation so we have no pore filler or, for example, staining. We also looked into the data evaluation. So in order to extract the information about the porous network, we needed to segment our 3D fibs and data. And therefore, we developed a self-learning segmentation algorithm and we also visualized and quantified the interconnectivity in 3D. We also determined pore size and pore morphology, as well as uh, measured the water permeability and later on then uh, simulated mass transport through these porous network. So we could correlate structures to the transport properties. And regarding the materials, I've been studying two different systems. One is called model polymer films. And as you can see in this little figure here, it is a flat face separate polymer film. And this figure will follow you throughout the full presentation so you can uh, easily capture which sample I'm talking about. And these model polymer films are produced by having a rotating Teflon drum and moving spraying nozzle that sprays the polymer solution onto the drum. And after the spraying process is finished, the film is cut off and stored before we can put it into the fib sample. The next system then is polymer film coatings. And you're already familiar with the pellet, as you can see here, 
the core in the middle and the coating uh, on the core here. And these are produced in a so-called fluidized bed. And then this is the fluidized bed. And you see uh, two walls in the fluidized bed here, as well as uh, these core, um, which then corresponds to the core in the petlet. From the bottom here, you have an airflow and the polymer solution is entering the fluidized bed from the bottom. And thanks to the airflow, we can then get this spray zone in the fluidized bed. And please keep track of these two cores in the, down here. And then they're entering the spray zone, they get coated, they go up and they dry. They enter the spraying zone, go up and they dry. So this is how we build up these types of coatings in the fluidized bed. And regarding the composition in the, in the film stand, so for the model polymer films, I've been investigating uh, samples containing uh, 22, 30, and 45 weight percent of HPC. And the argue behind that is, back to these previous work performed by Maria Grazia and her colleagues, is that HPC 22 is at the permeability onset, while HPC 30 is high above the permeability onset, and HPC 45 is then high, much higher above the permeability onset. And the coating thickness is around 130 to 160 micrometer. And regarding the other system then, the polymer film coatings, uh, I've studied eight different uh, samples and we varied the core diameter being either 300 and 650 micrometer. The weight percent is either 25, which is at the permeability onset, as well as high above for the 40 case, and changed the coating thickness between 10 micrometer and 40 micrometer. So either thin or thick coatings. On the top row here, you can see the small pellets with a small core. And on the bottom row here, you can see the big pellets with the big core. Now for the methods. So this is then the focus time beam scanning electron microscope, which we denote as FibSAM. And this instrument here has been my best friends the last couple of years now, days and nights. And I made a cross section here. So uh, on the instruments, you can see that the focused ion beam, where we use gallium ions to remove the material. You can see the ion column here. And then we use the scanning electron microscope, the SEM part then, to uh, image the sample surface with electrons. And a very nice feature of our microscope here is that we have a gas injection system down here. So you can see the tubes. And this is actually a crucial uh, feature for my, uh, my PhD product, since I use carbon gas prior to electron imaging in order to neutralize the charges at the surface. I also use, for example, platinum to deposit on the area that goes going to be sliced up in order to reduce, for example, cutting. So when we are imaging with electrons, there is an interaction between the electron beam and the sample surface. So closest to the surface, we get secondary electrons and deeper inside the material, we get the back backscattered electron uh, electrons. And regarding the secondary electrons, they have lower energy than 50 electron volts, and they are strongly affected by charging. And that is why I mentioned it, because it's really important for poorly conductive materials. So charging is accumulation of charges at the sample surface due to the poorly conductive material. And the backscattered electrons, they have a higher energy, and they are less affected by charging. So when determining which signal to use to image your sample, um, it plays a very important role if it is secondary or electrons. Now for the FibSEM tomography procedure here, which is a slice and image procedure. So what you see in this image here is the sample surface of a pellet. So it is this outer layer here. And you can see that I have milled uh, these trenches here in order to reveal the cross-section surface. So this is actually a so-called U-shape. So you see the edge here, this is the top surface, and this is the coating, and this is the core. So you can see which one it is in the figure here. So in order to acquire the 3D data, I perform a cross-section on the top surface and an image with the electrons. And here you can also see the platinum layer on the top, the coating, and then the interface between the coating and the core. And then I slice again with the ion beam and I image with electrons. I slice with the ion beam and then I image with electrons. And that's how I acquire the high special resolution 3D data. 
I can also then determine the slice thickness. In, in my experience, I use either 50 nanometer or 30 nanometer. You can go below 10 as well, depending on your structural features. And here's also the slicing direction in this said uh, direction. Now over for the results and discussion. So in order to acquire high special resolution 3D data on these soft pores and poorly conducting materials, I needed to optimize the parameters for the ion and electrons. In order to, regarding the ion beam then, to reduce, for example, redeposition, and redeposition is already milled away material that is depositing back to the cross-section surface. And to reduce curtaining effects, as you can see here, there's vertical lines are due to the ion beam, and it's called curtaining. So the first step was then to deposit a protective platinum layer, which is a well-known procedure. Um, and then is to, fine tune the ion beam parameters. And I started out with ion beam and it being 30 kV and it worked very well for these e materials. And the ion beam current was a stepwise procedure uh, starting at 40 nanoamps for the big trenches and closer to the cross section surface, I used a more gentle milling. Um, so narrow trenches is 10 nanoamp and then slicing is actually one nanoamp. And that's how I can acquire cross section surfaces without these artifacts. And then regarding optimization of the electron beam imaging parameters is in order to reduce shadowing effects. As you can see here, this shadow is then blocking the cross-section surface, and that is due to the surrounding material. And also to reduce charging effects. And as you can see here, uh, or maybe you actually can't because it's the, it has actually pores here, and you have these very dark areas and also bright areas. So it's both image distortion and charging. So in order to get rid of this and acquire um, cross-section surface without these imaging artifacts, I first uh, created one of these U-shapes, as I just showed you some slides ago, and then fine-tuned the electron beam parameters. And here I started out at 2 kV and went down stepwise procedure uh, and reached 700 electron volts, which worked very fine for this um, acquisition. And then I went to optimize the electron beam current. Uh, and that is actually the lowest possible for our instrument, which is below 10 picoamp. And I also pointed out very recently that it's important to choose which uh, electrons to detect. So we use, uh, so we detect backscattered electrons. However, this wasn't enough. We still uh, had some charging problems. And that brings us into the charge neutralization method on the next slide. Here we then have injection of carbon gas prior to imaging. So on the image to the left here, you can see some overexposed areas. And um, I highlighted with these arrows here. And on the image to the right here, you can see that we don't have them. And that's because I imaged using the charge neutralization. However, I noticed that the distance between the gas valve and the cross-section surface plays a very important role. So if the gas valve was too close to the cross-section surface, I got uh, carbon deposition. And I noticed that by uh, acquiring then uh, achieving um, curtaining in the next following slice, which I don't want. And then also if the gas valve was too far away, I did not acquire any, um, achieve any uh, short neutralization. So what I did was to retract it and found out that uh, it's 10 seconds retraction that worked very well to obtain this charge neutralization. And then in order to extract the porous information uh, from these porous network and the FIBSEM data, we uh, developed a self-learning segmentation algorithm. So if you take a look on the cross-section surface here, you can see that we have information from the cross-section surface as well from inside the pores, which is then subsurface information which makes it really tricky if I put up it for you here. So you have irregions that are more porous and solid region and less porous region. So what we can see here is that we have overlapping intensities, which means that we have kind of the same gray value in the solid region as well as in the less porous region and more porous region. I started out uh, trying with normal thresholding, did not work. I also started out with manually marking the pores. However, this was a very time-consuming approach. So I'm very happy uh, that my colleague, Dr. Magnus Röding from RISE helped me out and develop this self-learning segmentation algorithm. 
And what he did was to use my manually marked cord data to train his self-learning segmentation algorithm. So we finally could acquire, uh, obtain the, the segmented 3D tips and data. Then over to cross-sectional images of the model polymer fins, as you can see here. Uh, to the left, it is HPC 22 and HPC 30 in middle and HPC 45 to the right here. And from this then, only by our eyes, we can see an increase in pore size with increasing HPC weight percent. If we then take a look on the 3D reconstructions of these model polymer films, to the left here, you have the HPC 22 again uh, at permeability onset. And I'm going to start with playing this video for you here. And the slice thickness is 50 nanometer. And the width here is uh, 30 micrometer and the height is 20 and the depth is 10 micrometer. And then we play HPC 30. And here you can see some flash flashes and uh, yes, that is charging. However, I managed to reduce it enough to be able to use our self-learning segmentation algorithm. And then we have HPC 45 and start slicing into it. And you can see here that we have a larger pore size as well as less solid regions. So that is the importance with uh, the 3D reconstructions that we can see that we have an increasing <laughs> fraction of solid regions with decreasing <laughs> HPC weight percent. If we now move on to the cross-sectional images of the polymer film coatings on the pellets then, to the left here, you have the thin coatings, 10 micrometer. So I marked the interface between the coating here and the core. And this is the coating and this is the core. And uh, then you have the thick coatings here, which is then 40 micrometer. And I want to drag your attention to the small core, HPC 25 thin film. Here you can see that we have larger regions of these solid areas. And on, for example, the case of big core HPC 40, you can see that it's uh, porous throughout the full system. So we do not have the, um, the solid regions here. So increasing fraction of solid regions with decreasing HPC weight percent and core diameter. That is very uh, valuable information that we get from these pellet study. Now for the 3D reconstructions of these pellets then. To your left here, you have um, HPC 40, so we are high above the permeability onset on a big core. To the right here, you have HPC 40, uh, still the same content, HPC content, and on a small core. And I want to point out here that you have more porous region, less porous region, and more porous. So you have this layered structure here. And in the small core, down here you have the core, and here starts the coating then, and then you have porous region, solid region, porous region. So you can keep track of these um, different regions throughout the film, and you will see that they stay on the similar place throughout the full film. And here it is, um, slice thickness being uh, 30 nanometer. So from this then we can see coating on big core have less porous region and more porous region. While coating on small core have porous region and solid regions. If we then change the HPC content to HPC 25, so we are at the permeability onset, and we look on the coating on big core and HPC 25 on small core. Here you can already see that we have this same layered structure, more porous region and less porous region. And to the right here, you can see a huge, large, solid region. Porous region, solid region, porous, and then down here we have the core. And please keep track of the left corner up here. Uh, you might see some difference in the, in the contrast. You have to watch to see what I mean. So we're slicing into the material, and it's 30 nanometer here as well. So as you could see, something that looked like channels appeared up here. So we wanted to understand um, how we actually can leach out this HPC, even though we have this large solid region. 
So I looked into another sample, uh, still HPC 25 and small core, but on another pellet. So here then you see the interface between the core and the coating. And you can also see some cores down closest to, to, um, to the core here. So we, I'm just going to play it for you. So now you can see up to the left that we also get these difference in the contrast. And soon I'm going to extract the porous information in red for you. So now you can actually see that this porous structures closest to the core is connected through these channels to the top of the pellet. This can then uh, explain how we can leach out these pores structure closed, um, even though we have these solid region here. I put some snapshots here for you, so you can still you can see the interface here between the core and the coating. And here is then the porous information uh, extracted in red. And here you can see the channel that connects the top of the pellets through the solid region to the porous structure closest to the core. However, we really wanted to understand this HPC release even further. So my colleague at AstraZeneca, Dr. Anna Viridén, performed these release measurements. Uh, so you have the HPC release versus the time. And I summarized this to this little box for you. So you have the release rate here. And on the bottom here, you have a um, small core HPC 25 thick fill. And that had the uh, slowest release rate, and it is this sample over here, you can see that we have these uh, really large solid regions. And then the fastest release was on a, a big HPC-40 thin film, as you can see here, it's highly porous. So from this study then, we can see small pellets have slower release rate than big pellets. Then for the 3D quantification of the porous network, which is in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Sandra Barman, and where she developed uh, measures to determine pore morphology. So in this case, then, we fit uh, spheres in 3D in the porous network. Here, we fit circles in different directions. And we also fit lines in different directions in 2D in order to capture, for example, anisotropy in the porous network. Then we use geodesic path, which is the shortest possible path in order to visualize and quantify individual through path through the system. And the geodesic path has to fulfill following constraints. So it has to start as an inlet port. It has to pass through a point P and inlet anywhere um, at the outlet. We also use geodesic channels where parts of the porous network um, of the parts of the porous network where many paths coincide. And you can think of this as highways for the paths. Then we use geodesic totosity, and the uh, totosity value tau describes how much longer the pore paths are compared to the shortest possible path, which tau is equal to one. And I made a little sketch here to make you understand what I mean here. So from this part to this part, uh, it is a straight way, and then tau is equal one. However, this is more likely our case when tau is larger than one and the paths are more tortuous and entangled. So from the pore size and pore morphology, we can see for the case of HPC 22, that HPC 22 has the, uh, the smallest values uh, for both spheres, circles, and lines. And HPC 30 has the intermediate values and HPC 45 has the highest values which we then can summarize and now also quantify uh, by increasing pore size uh, with increasing HPC weight percent. From the individual through paths and totosity for HPC 22, we can then visualize and quantify individual through paths for uh, this porous network. So if we start here, is this inlet here? We can see that uh, the shortest path in black here is two point, um, roughly four uh, times longer than the possible shortest path, which could be one then, the straight way. 
And then we have uh, the intermediate in blue and the longest in red. So the red path here is then 3.8 times longer than, than the possible shortest path. And then for HPC 30, you can see that uh, the short path is more likely a straight way. And we can also see that by uh, looking at the totality values. And for HPC 45, it is more likely the straight way because it's almost uh, one. And regarding the long path here in red, we can see that is below, um, below two. So here we can say that in increasing totality with decreasing HPC weight percent. And from the geodesic channel measurements, we uh, we are part of the porous networks uh, where the paths coincide. Then think it of as the highways for the path. For HPC 30 and 45, we have natural channels here, uh, and that is due to the paths has to go to these pore here, uh, so they have to pass through these channels. If we then look at the interesting case here for HPC 22, we can uh, see a prominent channel where around 97 on the geodesic path passes through. And this, is, uh, this allows us to identify these crucial structural feature, uh, which is a limiting layer in the structure. However, this does not tell us anything about the mass transport properties since we do not simulate the mass transport here. Which brings us to the next slide where we have the transport properties uh, in order to correlate uh, the material structures with the transport properties. We both measured and simulated the diffusion through the porous network. And the effective diffusion coefficient, from now on, I'm going to say DF, describes diffusion through the porous network. And the simulated diffusion is in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Tobias Gierbeck here at Chalmers where he computed the DF uh, by solving the diffusion equation using the lattice Boltzmann method. We also simulated the mass transport um, through the porous network using a software Gesualdo, which is also developed here at Chalmers. Then we uh, measured, uh, experimentally measured the diffusion, and that is in collaboration with Dr. Johan Jatstam from AstraZeneca, where DF was calculated by uh, permeability measurement using a diffusion cell. So if we take a look at the results for HPC 22 first here, we have simulated DF being 6.25 times 10 to the power of minus 12. And the experimental DF is uh, very similar to the uh, simulate data. And in this figure here, you can see, so we needed to divide the, divide the mass transport simulations into five sub volumes due to the poor interconnectivity of this porous network. So that is what you see here. You see the top sub volume of the mass transport simulated. If we then take a look at the simulated um, DF value for HPC 30, we can see that it's close to, yeah, it is 200. Uh, and that is a big increase from uh, the simulated in the HPC 22 case. And I'm going to play this video for you here. And this is the segment and data that I'm removing. And now you can see the diffusion through the porous network in HPC 30. And here I want to point out that the blue corresponds to low flux values and the red to high flux values. And you can also see that we have these two main channels that are responsible for the diffusion through the system. And then for the last case, we have HPC 45, where you can see that we have even higher simulated DF values. And if I play this video for you here, you can see that the diffusion through the porous network is now evenly distributed. So from this study then, we can see an increasing transport with increasing HPC weight percent. Over to the conclusions. So today I showed you what I'm done doing my PhD work here, uh, and that is to develop uh, a protocol of how to optimize um, the FIB parameters in order to image porous and poorly conductive soft materials, where I then uh, used minimal sample preparation. We also, in order to extract the porous information, develop the self-learning segmentation algorithm in order to segment the data. 
We also performed 3D uh, quantification where we have individual throughput, for example, short, intermediate, and long throughput. We also identify crucial structural features such as limiting layers. Uh, regarding the mass transport, we both uh, simulated the mass transport and measured the, the diffusion. And thanks to the high special resolution 3D data, we get a very good agreement between the simulations and experimental data. And we also studied then the effects of the pellet core, coating thickness, and HPC content. And what we could see here is an increasing release rate with increasing core diameter and HPC content. So to sum up, we can correlate um, the material structures to transport properties, and this enables us to tailor the controlled drug release. For example, these controlled drug release coatings. And for future work, I think it will be very interesting and um, to, to incorporate this charge neutralization method into the automatic 3D data acquisition. I think it can be very beneficial for uh, other microscopies out there uh, trying to uh, reconstruct their structures in 3D because um, it helps a lot to, to reduce the charging. It would be also very interesting to leach the polymer films to so keep both EP and HPC inside and perform a cross-section in the, in the FIBSAM. And then you change the pressure inside the FIBSAM and then allow water vapor inside to leach out HPC while imaging. In this way, we could, for example, maybe um, see where HPC, HPC could be entrapped in the EC. It would also be very interesting to reveal these through paths uh, with marker molecules. So for example, expose one of the polymer films um, into a solution with marker molecules, for example, metals, and then track where the molecules go throughout the 3D reconstructions, and then also see which paths are preferable. I would like to acknowledge the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research for funding my fun PhD project. AstraZeneca, uh, for providing the exciting and challenging material. RISE Research Institute of Sweden for amazing collaborations. Eva Olsen Group, my colleagues, uh, thank you so much for the amazing support throughout these years. Um, it has been very fun to follow your scientific journeys. Um, thank you for sharing with me. I would like uh, to um, thank Dr. Torben Nilsson Pingel, especially today uh, for helping me out with the setup of the cameras and the computers and the productions. Thank you so much for taking your time and helping with this. Then I would like to acknowledge my main supervisor, Professor Eva Olson, for accepting me as your PhD student and uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, learn from you. I've learned so much and um, yeah, I will always be grateful for that. I would also like to uh, thank my three assistant supervisors, uh, adjunct professor Niklas Vorén, for always sharing your positive energy uh, with me uh, and sharing on me and uh, your expertise. I would like to thank Dr. Christian von Kofschwant for uh, exciting discussions about the material and uh, Professor Ayla Sake for um, your valuable insight throughout my PhD journey and for always being such a humble person. My examiner, Patrick Johansson, uh, who's in the room here, for um, your guidance throughout my PhD journey. I really enjoyed um, and very grateful for your expertise and your advices. Dr. Sanna Bama from the SSF uh, project, thank you so much for these years together. Uh, it was pretty tricky in the beginning to understand each other's scientific language. You're from the mathematics side, I'm from the material science. Uh, but we worked out it pretty well in the end, and I'm so proud of our outcome in the research. Dr. Magnus Rading, thank you so much for uh, sharing your passion about uh, segmentation uh, with me. Uh, it, it has been a true pleasure to work with you. Dr. Tobias Gerbeck, thank you so much for taking your time to discuss mass transport simulations with me. And Professor Holger Rutzien and Dr. David Bullin for a great discussion throughout our SSF meetings. 
And from AstraZeneca, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anna Olsson for always taking so much time and, uh, to read and give feedback on our manuscripts. Uh, I'm really proud of our work together. Dr. Johan Jatstam, uh, thank you for showing me the chemistry lab at AstraZeneca and for taking your time to teach me about diffusion measurements. And Dr. Anna Vidian for performing uh, the HPC release measurements. Uh, Mats O. Johansson for showing me the lab at AstraZeneca and uh, telling me what I needed to know about the fluidized bed and the manufacturing of the pellets. And last but not least, I would like to thank Shalmus Materials Analysis Laboratory for great technical support at the microscope. And especially a huge thank to Dr. Stefan Gustafsson for always being there and supporting me at the Gaia system. And with that, I would like to thank you all who is watching here in the cameras and you who are in the room. And we're taking a short break and we'll continue shortly with the discussion. That's correct, Cecilia. Thank you for your presentation. So we'll take a short break, as Cecilia just said, and we'll uh, convey again here, uh, let's say, uh, 1425 at seven minutes. Okay? Going to my watch, All right?
So uh, welcome back again. Uh, so now it's time for the uh, discussion part of the thesis defense. So uh, Professor Seth will uh, uh, start the uh, discussion and uh, you hear us? Yes. Yes, and we hear you. So I, I leave okay. the floor, so to speak, and, and Cecilia is here, ready to answer. You can uh, continue the discussion as long as you want. There's okay. no time limit to this discussion, question, answer session. Please. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, um, Cecilia, for this uh, nice summary presentation. Um, I would like to start to talk a little bit about microscopy before I would like to come to more specific questions regarding your PhD thesis. Uh, you have done a very nice methodological work at the Gaia system, the major tool you have used, and you have shown the performance applicability to beam sensitive and poorly conductive materials. This tool that you have used in principle is an electron microscope and an ion microscope combined, even if you have mainly used uh, electron microscope for imaging. If my, my first question to warm up a bit is if you have to tell somebody who is not a physicist, what is a microscope? What you would say to this person? Uh, I would say that the microscope is that uh, we uh, can, uh, for example, visualize um, something, for example, we can't see with our eyes where we have photons instead. Uh, but in, uh, in the microscope, yeah, we can get better resolution because we use uh, the electrons or, as you say, um, that we can use ions instead. However, that's, that can be tricky for beam sensitive materials. So. Okay. And if you um, had to explain it to somebody who has engineering understanding and a bit understanding of optics, um, what would you say to him or her what a uh, microscope is? So I would say that we have an electron source at the top and then we are uh, emitting then electrons from uh, the source and then we are focusing using the, the lenses uh, onto the sample surface. And as I mentioned, we get an interaction between the electrons and, and the sample surface. and depending on which detector you can use. Um, you can, as I said, the secondary electrons or the backscatter electrons. Um, you can detect, for example, and uh, with the backscatter, it can, for example, be beneficial if you use uh, for uh, um, high contrast uh, elements. Uh, so you can distinguish uh, if you, for example, look at oxides <laughs> um, or if you imaging uh, the top surface, you want to maybe use the secondary electrons to uh, um, image the sample. Okay, so um, yeah, but you said is uh, absolutely correct for electron microscopy. More generally, for a microscope, the characteristic element is always an objective lens. If you have an objective lens, then you have a microscope. And uh, you have used the electron microscope, but um, can you tell me why you have uh, used for your studies a uh, scanning electron microscope and maybe why not a visible light microscope or why not an X-ray microscope? There are also different types of microscopes. Why you have chosen a scanning electron microscope? Okay, so there's different wavelengths on, for example, the electrons and compared to photons or X-rays. And uh, with the electrons, we can get the re resolution, for example, with the SEM down to one nanometer. Um, and that is suitable for these types of materials uh, to resolve the structures that we want to, to image in 3D, I would say. Yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. Um, can you compare the, the, the resolution of the microscope is one major parameter and addition, mm -hmm. of course, also the contrast that you have also mentioned in your PhD thesis, but can you compare the resolution of a 
let's say, scanning electron microscope with a visible light microscope or an X-ray microscope? Do you know the resolution values of the other microscopes? So I would say for the X-rays, it is, um, uh, I'm, I'm not, of course, not an expert in this area, but I would say down to uh, 10 nanometer. Um, and for the light uh, op um, optical microscope, I would say around uh, 100 nanometer uh, in its best case. Yeah, so maybe two are not in the best case, but okay. okay yeah. So uh, why it is, uh, what is the limitation for a visible light microscope? Why it is the resolution limited to some 100 nanometers? So it is the, um, the wavelength of, of uh, the visible light that we use as the source, the photons in, in the light microscope, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And do you know the physical process that is responsible for this limit? The, the wavelength or? Yeah, the, the wavelength, it is, the, is a parameter, but why uh, it is wavelength limited? Uh, the energy, I would say. Yeah, energy and wavelengths is practically the same. Uh, I wanted to, um, yeah, my question is, which is the physical process? Why a wave, uh, the resolution is limited by a wavelength? Why? Um, I'm kind of blocked in my head at the moment, so. Uh... Okay, so it's, it's uh, in principle, it's diffraction emitted, yeah, that I wanted to okay, yeah, ask thank you. you. Yeah. And, uh, Coming back to the scanning electron microscope, if uh, uh, in the usual range of uh, acceleration voltage, um, can you say which uh, wavelength is correlated to this energy of the electrons? Because you said very correctly, yes, the, the respective wavelengths is uh, shorter. It means uh, you should have better resolution, what you also see. And for instance, for uh, 10 keV also, do you know uh, the, which wavelengths it's corresponding to? Um. Uh, I would say, if you say 10 kV, it's the energy for 10 kV and... It's an acceleration voltage, yeah, yeah for uh, 10 kV, so the energy is 10 keV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the resolution, for example, could be then uh, down to one nano nanometer, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, the, the energy uh, of an electron, you can correlate to the wavelengths regarding the de Broglie relationship. Yeah? And mm -hmm. then it's for the usual acceleration voltages that we have in the scanning electron microscope, it's smaller than one nanometer. So in the TEM, it's higher mm -hmm. acceleration voltage than smaller than one angstrom. Yeah. And therefore, you can have this excellent uh, resolution. Um, in, the, in, the, in the scanning electron microscope or in the transmission electron microscope, you can focus the electrons with the electromagnetic field. Uh, how you, you can focus uh, photons, uh, for instance, in the light microscope or in the X-ray microscope. Um, for the light microscope, I would say with lenses. Yeah, which type of lenses? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but I would say... Yeah, but for sure you know this, yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Uh, glass lenses while yes. we... Yeah, and uh, uh, for the light microscope, yes. X-ray, um, um, yeah. I, I, I don't uh, come up with that uh, at the moment. <laughs> and for the light microscope, for if you have a glass lens, why, which is the physical process, why you can focus uh, the light? Do so you, you notice? The, the, the beam, 
um, mm -hmm. to the focal point, so you can focus uh, yeah. either over focus and under focus. And uh, yeah, 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 that's correct. Yeah, and do you know which physical process is responsible for this? Um, uh, I know it, but I can't okay. uh, find it in my head at the moment. Um, um, yeah. Do, do you know which uh, material parameter of the glass is the, influencing? The, in, the index? Yes, it's, and which index it is? The refractive index. Yeah, and the process is then refraction. Yeah, of yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. And could you use the same effect also for X-rays? Um, for x-rays, um, I don't, um, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's also a difficult question because for a long period of time, people did not have a solution for this. Therefore, x-ray microscopy is such a young technique. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it does not work with refractive uh, lenses because the uh, refractive index for x-rays for, for all materials that we know is approximately one and so you cannot use this effect and then you have to have other lenses but that's mm -hmm. not your topic and I will not first uh, ask into this direction I think uh, we had a good conversation about microscopy now I would like to come more to questions that are related to your PhD thesis and I would like to start with the part of sample preparation where yes. you have uh, also optimized the uh, fit milling parameters and you have created a series of planar cross sections yeah, for this uh, approach that you have used. And in your PhD thesis, you have written that the slice thickness you have chosen was several 10 nanometers, 30 or 50 nanometers. Yes. Um, my question is how have you chosen this optimum slice thickness, what was the criterion? So first I, um, the first step is then to see how big features or the structural features we have in the samples. And uh, we have to be able to capture uh, how the structures changes while we are slicing, for example. And if we slice with take 100 nanometer thick slices, we lose a lot of information. Uh, so if we then reduce the slice thickness, we can then capture um, the structural information that we need uh, to resolve in the, in the samples. Um, so that was, um, yeah, I, I first looked at how big structures do we have in the, these, uh, this material, and then I uh, adjusted the slice thickness in order to capture all the important uh, features. Okay, uh, what is the typical structure size of the samples that you have studied? That was the argument for choosing this thickness. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say um, the one we can resolve are, um, for example, for the pellets, um, that I showed you, they have smaller pore size, so mm. we need to uh, be below um, uh, one micrometer there, I would say. So, um, which is a very big step down to 30 nanometers in slide thickness, but we could distinguish some small pores as well. Yeah, what is the smallest pores that you have in your materials? Um, it's really tricky to determine that in these pellets, which have the smallest pore size, but mm -hmm. I would say um, uh, from this data, it was um, some, so I measured the, the pixel size that I could see in the, in the, in the cross section surface. And then it is roughly two or three pixel and each pixel is 30 nanometer. So I would say, um, below 90 um, nanometer then. Yeah, this brings me to a question I wanted to ask a bit later, but I can ask it, I think now, uh, 
because on page 23 of your thesis, yep. there, oh no, it was 23 in your presentation, uh, 44 in the thesis, there you have um, these uh, pore sizes and you have determined uh, differently for different geometries, but let's look for the sphere pore size, even knowing that the spheres are not, uh, that the pores are not uh, really spheres. Yeah. And if I look to this table, then always the minimum pore size is 50 nanometers. And uh, my question is, if it is always 50 nanometers, it's uh, a bit surprising for me that you have always the same minimum, but it could be, it could have a reason. Do you think, is this a reason caused by the material that there is really a minimum pore size or is this caused by your experimental technique, what you can determine? Is 50 nanometers. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, do you know what I mean with my question? Yeah, and uh, if you have this, this is table three in your PhD thesis, yeah, then, and you have for different samples for the three different HPC 22, 30, and 45, and then you have the average pore size, and then you have a minimum and a maximum. And the minimum is always. 50 uh, nanometers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I would say that it might be uh, due to the, the characterization measures, because uh, there we use, um, we change the voxel size, uh, if I remember correctly, which then results in, in 50 nanometer. Um, so so that means this is a limit given by the experimental technique but it could be that you also have smaller pores, yeah? Yeah, of, yeah. So, I, yeah, that was a really good uh, point, um, that um, they can be smaller pores, um, and uh, it would be, for example, really interesting to, um, to do that as a future work, to uh, create one of these TM lamellas and uh, investigate it further with higher resolution to see if we have smaller pores. Yeah, in, in principle, you have the potential with the scanning electron microscope to visualize also smaller pores than 50 nanometers. Yeah. And, uh, but it was limited by the chosen pixel of voxel size, yeah? Yeah. Um, that's true, and that uh, that could be acquired with a new data set uh, with uh, then, uh, for example, higher magnification. Um, here we wanted to capture the the larger um, structures, and um, but yeah, I, I I agree with you. It would be very interesting to look further into the, mm. the smallest pore size. Yeah. So okay, then. Um, Let's go further. You have established a protocol to reduce the cross-section artifacts. And this is on the one hand side, the chosen parameters, but on the other hand, you always would like to minimize also the milling time, not to waste too much time yeah. for the, for, uh, the cross-sectioning. So you have to find a compromise. And uh, could you explain a little bit more in detail, more detail than you have done it in your presentation today, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. you have fine-tuned the ion beam parameters, how you determined this protocol? Was it trial and error, or did you go a systematic way, or how you have determined it? Um, um... I'm looking for some slides here to okay. uh, just show you. What's the amazing thing? Uh, okay, so I can't. Um, 
You were asking about the ion beam parameters. Yes, for the, for the ion beam parameters, because I have understood you have a, now a kind of recipe or protocol, yeah. how to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, how you, because when you started your research, then at the beginning, you never know where is the optimum. How, how was the process? How you came to these yeah. parameters? Okay, so yeah, it was uh, in the beginning a uh, trial and error because uh, um, my yeah, it was the kind of first shock when I put it into the FibSAM and it was charging and it was uh, curtainings all over the place, and um, I yeah, I started out with high current and uh, reduced it further and further, and as uh, as you say, it has to be time efficient. Um, and that's why it was uh, very good that it worked with, for example, one nano amp uh, to reduce all the curtainings as well. So, and uh, yeah, so I started out that, for example, um, I tried for so first I uh, mill away all the surrounding material with 40 nano amps. So first I tried out uh, starting, for example, at 60 nano amps, but then I noticed that I made an impact on the structures of the, the polymer films. So then I had to reduce it and notice that 40 nanoamps work very well. I do not uh, make an impact on the cross-section surface. And then I did this for the narrow trenches closest to the cross-section surface as well for the slicing. Uh, so I tried um, higher current also, but then I had curtainings effect. Um, and one nanoamp was both time efficient and I could reduce the, the curtaining. Okay, um, how long did it take you such a cross section? Um, so during the, um, the 3D data acquisition, it takes, um, when I finally found all the parameters, it takes um, a couple of seconds, I would say, depending also how big and, and uh, large volume you're slicing here. For example, regarding the pellets, it took, uh, Maybe two or four seconds, yeah. I do not know if you, uh, for me it's amazing that it's so short, but the cross-sectioning process, how long was this to, to prepare one cross-section? It's, it's in seconds? Uh -huh, you mean uh, before no, I even had cannot be. Yeah, so um, um, the cross-section itself is, is fast, but finding the parameters took uh, took a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, but uh, now you have this um, recipe, this protocol. Yeah. Yeah. And how long does it take you now to uh, perform such a cross section? Um, now it takes a couple of seconds when I acquire the data. Oh, so, so I so have then, the Yeah. Okay, so then milling time is not a real critical point. Yeah. So nope. then. Yes, I'm uh, asking because I thought maybe it's also, you can think about to have a, a multiple step process, but then if it is so fast, then it's fine. Um, have you, to, to find this optimum parameters, have you also thought about uh, do modeling of the process, uh, how the gallium ions interact with your material? Yeah. Uh, and also, for example, uh, simulate the, the interaction of the electron beam with, for example, Monte Carlo simulations. I've been thinking about that, um, but um, it's really tricky. Um, I'm not an expert, expert at all in that field, but I, um, it's, since it's also porous, I have to consider that also into the simulations. Um, but they would be very... Uh, interesting if it, if it would be possible to do do that mm -hmm. yes. and also like if you want to look into other materials that could also be um, a good starting point then mm -hmm. I, I think so too and uh, this there has been done a lot of modeling for uh, for instance single crystalline silicon and so there it's uh, yeah, there you have a very defined system, but in your case, the material system is much more complex. And uh, I think uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, could be a very interesting approach. However, maybe it's a separate PhD thesis um, because the, describing these uh, 
elastic collision interaction and uh, the collision cascades of the gallium ion is uh, more complex than in silicon. But um, in principle, uh, it could be a way if also this technique will be applied to other materials to get directions for optimized parameters. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now um, let's come to the serial sectioning technique and the and the, the imaging. Yeah. Yep. And the tomography is generally a sequential imaging and uh, you have used the combination of focused ion beam and scanning electron microscopy. Um, which other tomography techniques as exist? And can you, yeah, do you also know other tomography techniques that are maybe not based on serial sectioning? Um, for example, TM tomography, okay. where you have um, the lift out of a very thin TM lamella. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I think you can see my hand here that you are tilting it to different directions and uh, then you can reconstruct the structures uh, uh, during post-processing. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, um, um, the area that uh, you, Professor Erfried, is expert in, the, the x-rays, um, which is a non-destructive uh, um, technique which uh, you don't need to slice, and that, that's the non-destructive for um, acquiring the data. Yeah, okay. So um, can you, if we have this uh, serial sectioning technique that you have used, and maybe in comparison to X-ray computer tomography, can you say some advantages of your technique and maybe advantages of the X-ray technique? Um, if, you, if, you, if you have to compare it, because you have done this and, mm, okay, you're right, I'm, I'm working in the field of X-ray microscopy. If you have to convince me why you have chosen the right technique, which arguments you would like to bring into? Yeah, so the first I would say um, to, to determine which uh, technique to use is to which resolution do you need in order to resolve the structures. Okay, yeah, that's very important. And there you have a clear advantage with um, your electron, uh, with your technique. Yeah, absolutely. Because you have resolution of one nanometer and in the laboratory for X-ray, microscopy and related tomography, you have in the best case 50 nanometers today. So that's that's an advantage. Do you have other advantages? Um, I would also consider which material you want to, to image. Uh, okay. I, um, for example, the, the soft material that I've been working with, um, I, I don't know how it would be in, in the X-rays uh, computer tomography, actually. So... Um, what uh, does it mean you don't know which, uh, where you are, why you are skeptical? I mean, beam damage, for example, uh, okay. or how that it could um, affect the, the sample. Uh, in that way, I would say that it, it is possible to, to image the soft materials in the, in the FIBSAM. Um, even though it's a destructive technique. Mm -hmm. um, beam damage is always a critical point. However, usually it is more critical for electrons than for X-rays, but mm -hmm. it's not, a, if I'm saying most, in most cases, but it's not for sure for all materials. That's a, that's a good argument. It has to be considered. Do you also have other points that have to be discussed depending on the materials, particularly the materials you have uh, studied? Um, I'm also, uh, so another advantage is, I would say also to, um, uh, in the FIB, I know that you can, for example, choose uh, the area, uh, so you know that you are at the representative area of the sample to, to uh, acquire the data. 
Mm. And um, I don't know how you you can select that in the in the um, X-ray computer tomography technique. Um, yeah, yeah, works generally. Um, mm. I think one of the critical points in the X-ray tomography is the contrast. Yeah, if you have uh, light materials, then the contrast is uh, weak, and mm. you have to find uh, techniques to enhance the contrast, for instance, the face contrast imaging or so. Yeah, so um, if you, maybe one interesting point in this comparison is which artifacts uh, can be in these techniques. Can you say at first which artifacts you have in the FIP SEM technique? Or, or is it all artifact free? Mm, do you mean um, after I optimize, for example, all the parameters or? Yes, after you have optimized all the parameters, all is fine. You measure, uh, yeah. you have the data acquisition and then the data analysis. Mm -hmm. And of course, you always have in each step, you have some failures also. Uh, these are yeah, measurement failures and accuracy, but maybe also others. Uh, do you, can you say which is the major impact in your technique? Mm, um, I mean, I'm just thinking of, uh, it's not an artifact, but uh, as I mentioned with you, the ha this subsurface information from the pores when we're imaging, for example, that mm -hmm. makes it really tricky to, um, to, for example, perform the segmentation part. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not an artifact caused by the, the instrument, but it is due to the, um, the imaging part, because mm -hmm. we can image in the, in the pore structures. Um, and um, it's... Uh, it's um, it's not caused by the ion or beam or electron beam imaging either, but uh, it is a small volume and it is a time consuming process um, mm -hmm. um, it, to slice up a, a larger volume, for example. But uh, I wouldn't say that there's an, an artifact um, in the material. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what, okay, yeah. One thing I'm thinking of is gallium ions implementation into the yes. software. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, however, um, I have not looked into uh, how deep the gallium ions are um, uh, in the material, but um, I can't see that it affects the cross-section surface, actually. So. Um, yeah, but you have some implement uh, yeah, yeah. some uh, gallium ions implemented into the near surface region, and okay. Um, is thermal drift an issue in your case, sample drift? Or uh, yeah, of course. Uh, it, is, uh, it has been really challenging with the drift. Uh, okay, this is what I expected, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also what I described in the, in the thesis, uh, how to, um, uh, yeah. So it's a, a more semi-automatic acquisition of the 3D data since I need to stop the procedure, move it back, and then start again. So mm -hmm. it's time consuming due to the drift problems. Yeah. And, um, okay, if you compare it now to X-ray tomography, where you mm -hmm. rotate a sample, mm -hmm. do you see, a, do you expect additional failures in an X-ray microscope that you do not have with your technique? Uh, did I? I didn't catch. Is it the thermal no. drift or, or? Yeah, thermal drift is also an issue. Yes, but do you expect additional failures if you rotate a sample? Yeah, it's a it's a mechanical pre precision of the rotation. Mm. That's the same if you do it in the TM for electron mm. uh, tomography, and uh, also adjustment uh, can be a problem. So there are some additional effects that have to be considered. So I wanted to discuss this with you to see 
and that each technique has advantages but also disadvantages and maybe it's also a good idea to think about how to combine these techniques mm -hmm. and uh, because um, yeah seeing this uh, I think uh, you are much much better in resolution and so that's not possible at the moment with x-ray tomography on the other hand it's non-destructive which allows also maybe in situ or operando studies yeah so mm -hmm. therefore it depends always on the task you have which technique you are using but that's a, that's a really good point so you really have to mount the sample uh, since uh, i mentioned earlier you need mm -hmm. to tilt up the sample towards the ion beam so it's need to be mounted very well yeah yeah. So now my last uh, part of questions uh, is regarding the, let's say, data analysis. And I have a question if you have in your thesis on page 45, there is this uh, spherical pore size distribution. And if I look to these uh, to this figure, then it seems to me that it is a kind of bimodal distribution because you have uh, always two maxima. Yeah. Uh, is this something which is expected, or you can explain? Or uh, so um, we've been looking into it, and uh, we also yeah noticed it. So it's a very good point from you, and. Uh, um yeah it is it it um it is um it's a very good question uh question and uh, um i can't explain it but obviously mm -hmm. it is there in the in the in the data analysis yeah so i if it is a, a real effect that you have such a bimodal pore size distribution mm -hmm. then it would be very interesting to study this a little bit more in detail because I would expect that such a bimodal distribution will certainly affect the transport properties in the material. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I'm, I'm asking this because I'm not so familiar with this material and I do not know if it can be happen or not, but Mm -hmm. uh, for me, this experimental result that you are showing here, um, it seems to me that it is a kind of bimodal distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so then I have already asked for this minimum value. This is clear. And now let's come to at the end to the topic tortuosity, which uh, describes uh, the fluid flows in porous media. And uh, it's in principle a quantification of the interconnectivity of the pores. And um, if I look, for instance, on page 49 of your PhD thesis, then you have several tortuosity values. I'm expecting that the first value is a kind of average value and then have minimum and maximum. And you have then discussed uh, the, the average value. My question is what we can learn from minimum and maximum and which value is the most important one? So I would say from the from the minimum and maximum values, we can see that there is a, a difference in the different directions. So if we take for for example HPC twenty two here, we can see that the velocity varies um, more in the y direction uh, when we have a. Uh, compared to the, for example, the, the X direction, where it's more uh, similar for the, um, the stochastic values. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's why, I, especially for the case of HPC 22 here, we can see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I see. Now I have uh, 
more uh, a question regarding the whole procedure of the data analysis. In principle, you have uh, the 3D reconstructed tomography data. This is the output or the direct output of your uh, serial section and technique. Yeah? Yes. And then you calculate from this data one value, the tortuosity. And after you have calculated it here in this table, then you, it is followed by a qualitative discussion of fluid dynamics or transport processes. Yes. Um, I think that's, that's fine. And, but let me come back to what I have said at the beginning today. I said one real advantage of your PhD thesis, and I like it very much, is that you have done this clear step to quantitative data. But then at the end, I guess um, it could, you have much more information than you are using because you have a whole set of three data, the whole morphology of the material, mm -hmm. and then you, uh, you bring it down to one value, to tortuosity. And I know that engineers like this very much. Yeah? So when I talk uh, in my institute to the battery folks, they, they always ask, oh, can you say us tortuosity? And then they have one value and then they are very happy. But from my point of view, it would be possible to use the 3D data that you have after the reconstruction and generate a finite element model where you have then segmentation, surface mesh, FEM mesh, which is ultra fine. And in principle, uh, use then, uh, let's say, fluid dynamic part of finite element software, for instance, ENSYS, and get much more information out of this for transport processes than only this one parameter. Uh, is this idea okay or is there a failure in my thinking? Oh, I had, uh, that was a lot of information, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the question is why stop or, or why reduce the, the excellent information that you have, the whole 3D data set and reduce yeah. it to one value, tortuosity and say, okay, for this materials is 1.27, full stop. Why not using this three data and go the next step and use it as an input for uh, finite element modeling? Um, that's a very good question. Um, however, it's very interesting also to, um, with this only one value, to, in, to see and, and then visualize the individual um, uh, parts in the structure. So, um, yeah, I would say that it is um, a way to visualize the, the transport part, uh, part instead. Um, but that could be a, a next step, of course, to, um, to, uh, to use then the full data as you, you suggest. I think so too, yeah. So, and uh, of course, maybe this finite element uh, modeling is nothing what you can do on Friday afternoon. Uh, maybe it's a, a separate topic, but I, from my point of view, you have uh, such an excellent set of data and mm -hmm. I think uh, could be done also more out of this in, in future and maybe use it directly for finite element modeling. Okay, so um, these were the questions to the PhD thesis. Then I have a very last question to you, um, I think you have heard from correlative microscopy where different types of microscopy are used. And if, for instance, if uh, I see the, the pore sizes going up to several microns, do you think it could also make sense not only to use uh, focus ion beam scanning electron microscopy, but maybe also other microscopy techniques like 
visible light microscopy to study uh, the samples and get additional information or fluorescence-based uh, microscopy techniques. Yeah, so there are some uh, work already done on that. So, for example, mm -hmm. the previous work have shown confocal microscopy, where they uh, mark the HPC. Um, so they keep both the HPC and HPC in the films. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. reach out then. So um, they have used uh, confocal, for example. Um, I, I think it would be very interesting to try uh, and... Um, and uh, image the, a full pellet, for example, uh, to get the, the large view and see um, mm. if it's possible to resolve, for example, the channels um, in the structure of the coatings. Mm. Okay, good. Then uh, thank you very much. So I'm at the end of the long list of questions that I had and thank you very much for your answers. Thank very you very much discussion. for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tzetz. Uh, we now turn to the thesis committee. Uh, you are now visible here in the Zoom. Yes, very good. And uh, let's, let's uh, start with Professor Wallenberg from Lund University. Okay, thank you very much. Um, nice presentation. I would have liked to be there in person, but I thought it was better to keep a safe distance. Not only because of the coronavirus, but I also know what you do in your spare time when you're not doing so. <laughs> um, right, so uh, if we go to the uh, electron microscopy of these structures, um, we talked about the, the ion beam before, but you chose this um, sort of isoelectronic point of about 700 volts. Uh, and you chose the backscatter detector because you had less charging problems then. If you had a, a less charging material, would you have liked to use the SE detector? Mm, I think it depends what's inside the materials also, actually. Um, for example, if you have these uh, elements that give higher contrast, it might be easier with the backscatter. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the interpretation of the image? if you use secondary electrons. Oh, yeah, of course. So uh, if I had no charging samples at all, I would go with, uh, the, with the SE, um, as I showed on the slides before. We get the SE from the very top surface of the sample, so it's more surface sensitive. So we might then uh, reduce the, the subsurface information. We, we, would, we will still see, because I, I have the data on it from the secondary electron detector, uh, inside the pores, but of course that would reduce um, the subsurface information. Yeah. You don't think you would have problems with the segmentation of what's a hole and what's material? Mm. Um. Yeah, that could be a disadvantage maybe with the, it also depends on what, what material we have in, in uh, we we're looking into, but um, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. It might be more difficult actually because uh, you get this sort of um, false image. You can't determine whether it's a hole or a hill or whatever if you use secondary. So I think backscatter is much more straightforward. You get the mm -hmm. topography more. Um, is there any advantage resolution wise to use the SC? Um, I would say that it's, uh, it's more surface sensitive. Right. So, um, and also, uh, yeah, it would be, yeah, it would depend also which material we were looking at um, if we don't have any charging, for example. So, right. So, if you you chose the backscatter detector, what what determines the resolution in, in the backscatter image? Uh, I would say also the um, which accelerator voltage you can use. Right. Um, so um, backscatters usually have that you use a higher voltage. Um, in our case, we use uh, so-called mid-angle backscatter electron detectors, which so we can use a uh, lower voltage in order to detect the backscatter ele uh, electrons. Right. But so if you compare the secondary electron, you, you get more or less the beam diameter. 
uh, but in the backscatter, what determines the resolution there? You said the accelerating voltage, which is correct, but yeah, but also you have the interaction volume yeah. for because it's uh, deeper inside the material, right? So uh, you said you didn't do any Monte Carlo simulations, but do you have an idea of what the excitation volume is at 700 volts in the, these kind of materials? No, I um, uh, I I can't say that, but um, um, I noticed that if I um, if I increase the voltage, uh, I do get um, a more like shine through um, mm -hmm. uh, imaging. Um, I can show you a slide on it if you want. Um, I can show, for example, here. Yeah, you can see it here. So here I use um, 30 keV uh, when I'm imaging and you can see that it's really shine through. Uh, you can't really tell what is the cross-section surface and when if we look at the for example one kv here mm -hmm. okay yeah i'll say that now i was uh, more thinking of what determines the ultimate resolution of your images so wh mm -hmm. what is the uh, pixel size or voxel size that you can have with your uh, imaging? The, like the beam beam diameter you're thinking of or well, you, you scan with a certain pixel size, which probably is less than what you have in, in resolution wise. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, for this data, we use uh, the pixel size 30 nanometer. Right. Okay. And I was also thinking of this when, when uh, in paper two, you, had a, you were looking at this segmentation there. Um, oh. Performed by an expert, it said. Is that you? Oh, once again, what did you say? <laughs> it said the segmentation was performed by an expert. Is that you or is it someone else? Just oh, no. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, maybe it's uh, it's uh, on me. I don't... Uh, um, I, yeah, I manually marked the pores, yes. And yep. I've been looking okay. on these pores for years now, so... <laughs> yeah, so you are an expert. No, but um, <laughs> uh, on page 10 in, in paper 10, you said... Uh, in the process, we remove any feature which is less than 100 pixels when you did the linear scale space features. Okay, yeah. Gaussian feature. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how large are these features that you remove? Oh, um, 100 pixels. Uh, um, is it three microns then? Uh, I'm just thinking if we use, um, um, like so, it. yeah, it is. So this is some process to, to find the, the features in, in the materials, right? Mm -hmm. you, you test larger and larger Gaussian convolution with the image. I was just wondering about that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it actually is, is sort of destroying the resolution in your image or not, but uh, um, it, it um, sounded a bit like you're removing the finest features you can find, but. Maybe. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I can't answer that better because uh, it's uh, my colleague, uh, Magnus Rödin, who's performed the segmentation. Right. So. But I can bring the question on to him. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so you have different ways of, of visualizing these pores, and, and one of them was the sort of geodesic path. Yes. Which I, I it's not your, your speciality, I know, but uh, I, I think you, might have a better understanding than I have, because I have a problem of what the role of this point P is, because you're, you're sort of forcing diffusion through this point P, which sounds very unnatural because the molecules move the way they want. Mm -hmm. But that is, uh, that is the way for us to, to, um, to visualize and then to determine the, um, the path. So that's why we have those constraints that it has to start at the inlet pore and uh, then has to go through a point P and then end at the outlet. So yeah. uh, that's the... 
that's you, a, you simulate this for a large number of peas everywhere. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying. I'm still trying to figure out what's the importance of having a pea in the beginning or a pea in the, in the end. Or what's the difference? What's a sort of physical explanation of this? But um, maybe it's just a. I don't know. Can you explain that in your own words? So. Um... My colleague then uh, calculated a lot of uh, peas randomly throughout the, 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 the network. And then uh, in order to, um, yeah, to then visualize and quantify, um, we use uh, different intervals for the peas. Um, so I have an image down here for you. So as you can see here, we have the geodesic path. So for right. the shortest path, we have P's, um, yeah, paths passing through, through the point P in, in this area, and then the shortest, and then, the, uh, no, sorry, intermediate and longest here. Right, okay. Um, right. Um, so, and then you have the, the, the so-called flow chart or the geodesic channel strength, which you mm -hmm. extract from this. Um, so you get these small red features, which you say is constrictions in the pores. Um, do you know the, the actual pore diameter in these points? Uh, are you, are you um, talking about the mass transport simulations now, or is it... Yeah, the, the geodesic channel strength. You know, you have these channels, blue channels. And you you mean these point. ones? Oh, sorry, this one. You mean this one? Um, yeah, probably. There's some red points showing where the bottlenecks are. Uh, maybe it's not that. Is it this one? Yeah. Mm. Let me see. I have this book here. Oh, sorry. Well, you, it's the images where you have the blue channels and then there's some red hotspots, so to speak, in, in the channels, which I are- I think it is uh, these ones where we have high yeah. channel things. So. Yeah. yeah, it could be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is the one, the case where you had two obvious channels and one is more prominent than the other. Mm -hmm. just wondering, could it just be that the pores are bigger here, so you actually get more flow through it or it's easier flow path or- yeah, so we can um, we can determine the the pore size uh, of the channel here. Uh, for example, if we we can do it also by us looking at the FIBSEM data, because we have the each of the yeah, slicing images here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so here is actually if if you also look in the FIBSEM data, you have these solid regions um, that I showed in the right in the cross sectional images. So there are only two. Yeah, high high ways as I call it for the pots here and here, and here we could then see that it is ninety seven percent of the pots passing through. Yeah, so the the pots are passing through. Where is it actually the the flow or the molecules passing through? Uh, so um, here there's no flow simulated. That is in the the mass transport simulations. All right. And. Um, here we, um, if I remember it correctly, we needed to reduce um, the the data here uh, in order to perform the mass transport simulations because it's really tricky and it's poor, uh, poorly in poorly interconnectivity in it. So, um, but that would be very nice to see um, if it just is transport through this channel as well. All right. Because if, if you know the diameter, you, you can determine whether it's an actual flow or if it's a mm. large pore simply. And I think you can do it, but um, all right. Um, um, yeah, there's other ways of measuring porosity, like, uh, you know, BET and uh, mercury porosimetry, which you mentioned, and helium pycnometry. Mm. Can you compare your your results with these, or is it possible to make these other kinds of measurements, the BET, for instance? Or so uh, I would say that uh, so with the FIBSEM we can see um, even these um, um, so-called closed pores uh, 
However, mm -hmm. um, since it can't be, be at, uh, okay, so that is also a resolution uh, question here, because uh, you can't have the pores uh, closed, because uh, we won't see them, because it's not that um, good contrast between the easy and HPC f um, elements here. So if you have a pore, it has somehow to be to connected to the porous network, because um, otherwise we can't leach out the water-soluble polymer. And that could, for example, be a, um, a reason due to um, the resolution limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it might be hard to do the BET, because my friends who are doing BET, they always ask for one gram of your, your material. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they mm -hmm. can't make an accurate measurements, and one gram might be difficult to get. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so you're looking at the release of this um, drug through the shell here, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, we have seen, back in 2004, we sort of worked with the same problem, uh, looking at uh, multi-unit dosage formulation. Mm -hmm. I saw that um, that paper. Okay. So we found something called a burst release in, you know, about 10 to 15 percent of the pellets actually show this burst release. The, uh, have you thought about this at all or or because it's a fairly large percentage that actually gives off all its its um, active drug at the same time? Mm -hmm. uh, so in my case, I've only been studying. I have no drug in the in the pellets, I only have the, um, yeah, the core and the, the coating. So, um, but that would be very interesting to try uh, to also have the drug and then study the release. Uh, um. Yeah, I think it may be a factor to take into account because mm -hmm. what we found was that they're actually in the fluidized bed, you start coating them and some particles will stick together. And then due to mechanical, they, they rip apart. And they form large windows, which releases all the. And when we had a drug which we could see with EDX, so we could see when when these windows were opened. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think it's a beautiful job you've done. I won't keep you anymore, but um, thank you very much for a very nice presentation, and I really enjoyed reading the thesis. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Wallenbay. We'll turn uh, over to uh, Professor Leifer from uh, Uppsala University. Right. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear yes. you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So thanks for uh, the opportunity to read your thesis. Um, uh, first, I have a question uh, to connect to uh, the, the voxel size. You went already into that before in the, in the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, your voxels are highly um, uh, non-quadratic, right? So high, highly rectangular. If you look at, uh, if I look at your image pixel size, which is around mm -hmm. 10 nanometers, uh, and the slicing depth is between um, 30 to 50 nanometers, they are quite rectangular. And now in this table, I don't remember exactly on which was it, was it page 44? Yes, yes, it was. 49, sorry, 49 table. Uh, no, it's page 44. Yeah, exactly. Hmm? Um, no, no, you had uh, you had somewhere you had the well, I think it's page 49 actually. You have the no the tortosity, yeah, tortosity, but you also could take the pore size. You have measured them in XY, right? XY is your SEM image plane, right? If I understand yeah. correctly, and Z yeah. is the cutting direction. Uh, so um, uh, how, how would the value look like uh, in the cutting direction, right? Of tortosity and pore size, because the, the voxel resolution or the mm -hmm. voxel based resolution is very different in the Z direction, right? Mm -hmm. Would you, did you do that? Uh, did you also ca calculate this tau, the tortuosity, or for Z direction? Yeah. Uh, I I can't remember right now. No, I I no, I don't remember for the Z direction. Yeah, it would be interesting to mm -hmm. know because um, that could give you directly uh, information on how the um, resolution in the different directions because the resolution is of course in this case it's 
voxel size be limited, right? It's not resolution limited by the SEM. Mm -hmm. So um, and also, so the the interest also here is in the especially in the y direction because that's what we think. Yeah. So then in the bottom, then then it should be the drag, and then the body side. So it should be the transport direction. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. I understand. I understand. Yes, yes. But uh, yeah, of course, I mean the the z direction maybe has not so much importance. But of course, you're working in a three-dimensional model here, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah, of course. course. It has an importance, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, right, yes. Mm. Okay. Good point, thank you. Yeah. Um, then I still didn't understand that. I mean, Reina was uh, discussing quite a bit around that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you have the, you have the um, uh, geodesic path. Yes. Length, and then you uh, make your diffusion model, right? But your diffusion <laughs> module, mod model is not based on the geodesic path length results, right? It's an independent model based on the Boltzmann equation, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and also the, the segmented, sorry, sorry for interrupting, sure. uh, but the segmented data is also, uh, so the input here is uh, adjusted to be able to perform the mass transport simulations. So it's... Mm -hmm. um, right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so... Um, Yes, yeah, so I mean, <laughs> my very simple question is, uh, and I think it came out already a bit here and there before in the discussion, so probably the answer is mm -hmm. no, but I would like to have a bit more of a discussion or argumentation around. If you have thought about that, uh, could you also extract uh, diffusion data from the geodesic path uh, that you obtain? You, you mean like trying to simulate through, through these... Um, uh, these, for example, these paths, or yeah, yeah, exactly. So, because the number of geodesic paths, uh, the um, number of nodes that you have in this geodesic path, mm -hmm. they have some relation to how good the, your liquid will diffuse through the uh, um, polymer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, um, I'm I'm not sure uh, if you could take this data and put it in in the, the, the software where you perform the mass transport simulations. Mm -hmm. um, um, but um, yeah, I'm just thinking how that would look like. We would see the same. Um, yeah, but it, it would be, yeah. I, I take that further to my to my colleagues because I, I don't know that actually. Well, it's, it's a pure ma mathematical uh, statistical mm -hmm. model, the geodesic path. It doesn't contain any physics on the uh size of the pores or so it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. okay um yes it was the voxel size um yes that was this part exactly sorry i'm going a bit backwards <laughs> it's okay <laughs> no um yes exactly so um uh i couldn't clearly uh you know i have done quite a bit of uh, tm tomography Mm -hmm. um, and I could not clearly, um, see, you, you say, okay, that's a reconstruction, ta, ta, ta. and uh, let me just summarize what I understood from the reading. So you have, you come with your 3D data set, your stack. Uh, first, you have to align this, the, the images. Maybe you still have had some residual drift, right? Do you do that? If, yeah. If so, stay, right? yeah. Uh, yeah. So first I take the data and then we perform um, uh, the registration part. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, um, and then at some at, after that you okay. So then you get your first three-dimensional data stack, and then you make the segmentation, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, the reconstruction is basically done once you have registered your structures and you have your three-dimensional image cube, right? That's the reconstruction part, or? Yeah, that's the uh, when we have the segmented data. Yes. No, no, before no. you have the segmented data, or is the construction reconstruction part for you the part when you have finished the um, the segmentation? Is it before? Is reconstruction, mm -hmm. do you get a reconstruction before segmentation or after? I just was on the uh, So the when I acquire the 3D data, I can um, I can then see the 3D structures and the reconstruction of the FIBSIM data is done with the segmentated data. So we extract, so you get these, um, I can... Um, okay, so you make, sorry. Here. Okay, right. mm -hmm. 
yeah, so we get these. So this is the FIBSIM data then, and this is the, the segmented uh, the data. And that's where we perform the quantifications on, for example. Yes, but the segmentation you do on the 3D data set, set or? We do it on the, the 2D uh, images. Okay. Uh, so, as I showed here, I manually marked uh, sub uh, volumes or sub areas uh, mm. in the full data stack, and then we put it into the algorithm to, to train it. And uh, later on, we could then segment the full uh, data set. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Just for terminology, in case you should once get mm. in touch with uh, TM tomography, <laughs> mm. electromicroscopy tomographies. Uh, normally, the reconstruction is done when the mathematical reconstruction is done, and you have the three-dimensional volume uh, before before you do any uh, more tough uh, data treatment on the uh, on the image cube, yeah, on the data cube. So, okay, right, uh, yes, and then uh, on the injection of gases and so on. I mm -hmm. <laughs> we're working a lot on uh, FIP induced. Uh, uh, let's say gas induced modifications of uh, surfaces and materials inside the focus ion beam and electron beam electron beam with so with uh, reactive gases very often mm -hmm. so you talk about carbon gas carbon gas is just um, an organic precursor gas or what is it do you know that mm -hmm. um, I have a um... yeah so it is the gas which is done carbon uh, and it is um this component here that we can use as, uh, uh, you can also deposit it onto the surface, for example, like a protective uh, layer. Um, I also have um, an image of that um, here when I investigated which uh, to use for the, the protective layer. And here you can, for example, see carbon. But that is really tricky to use in, in this case because it's um, very similar in the, the contrast. Okay, but I, I think you saw you showed it on one of the slides. It's probably naphthalene, the gas that you're using, right? It's yeah. Just on the previous slide that you showed, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not carbon that you inject. You inject an organic precursor gas, right? Yes. That is then, for example, decomposed under the electron or ion beam, right? Okay. Right. Uh huh. Um, yes. Also, was you you, you use a, a palladium, a, a thin palladium layer to increase increase conductivity, right? Mm, yeah. Um, that's true, to reduce the, the charging of the whole, for mm -hmm. example, pellet or film, yes. So I believe that you have seen that, that is a real effect. Now, uh, I was a bit curious on why that should reduce the charging, because the platinum uh, or tungsten deposits that you also use, mm -hmm. um, they are quite metallic, they should take quite a bit of charge away. So why is the palladium so good? Um, I think it's also that I, I cover the whole pellets with uh, um, with a palladium, I do it ex situ in, in a spatter. Um, so I deposit on the hole. I use the rotation part in the spatter. So mm -hmm. I deposit on the hole. And I, I do believe that can uh, increase the connectivity for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, okay, right. Yes, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. It gets connected to that. Yeah, so basically, uh, you, you're saying when you're using the platinum deposit, it's just a local deposit. Yeah. But maybe the, the platinum doesn't go to the bottom of the um, exactly yeah. the granule, and then it do doesn't connect to ground, basically, to electrical ground, right? Mm. So that's um, oh. with the palladium then, then it's parted over the whole pellet. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm. I think maybe last question. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you're talking about, you're, you're searching the, this crossover point, right, to um, find the best point for charge neutrality of your surf sample, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you say, okay, there are two crossover points, E1 and E2, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is mm -hmm. the, uh, um, the, the reason why you have two crossover points? And apparently, of course, it's the uh, equilibrium between secondary and backscattered electrons and absorbed electrons in the sample, right? Mm -hmm. you're looking at why do you have uh, two crossover points there? So I believe that it might be. Um, um, yeah, so. Um, Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I'm trying to uh, try to connect in my head here. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so regarding those two points, I actually tried to find the other point uh, when I when I investigated which uh, voltage to use. 
However, uh, I could not reach that point because um, it was just charging and it destroyed my sample. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I have to look further into that. Mm. So you're talking about the other, the upper point, right? Yeah, you, exactly. So I found the uh, at two kV, we're charging a lot, and then I decreased and decreased, and then to 700 electromoles, <laughs> it, uh, it it worked well. I went uh, also below 700, but then the signal is too poor. Sure, sure. Okay, all right. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you, Professor Leifer. Uh, now, before I let in uh, Professor Clement here, we will uh, show up uh, uh, my uh, email address on the screen here so that people who are watching this on the YouTube channel can email me any questions that they might have. And then we'll collect them on the end. Okay, so my email address is uh, Michael Mikael dot Kal, K A L L at chalmers.se, okay? Michael Kahl at chalmers.se. So maybe you have had time now to sign, uh, to write that down if you're interested in sending questions. There might also be uh, a possibility to send in uh, questions on, uh, or more questions on the YouTube chat that we'll bring up later on. Okay. Having said that, uh, we'll see if we have some questions from Professor Clement. Of course. Uh, this is here, yeah, very nice done uh, presentation and a very interesting discussion with the uh, opponent. I have to start yeah. with a more unpleasant question. Uh, and uh, I wonder why there's only one paper accepted so far. Okay, yeah, I see. Um... I see the question. And um, so we wanted to um, get the first um, paper published before um, we submitted the other ones due to, we explained the full methodology how to optimize the FIBSEM uh, parameters. So we waited uh, and actually um, the process during the review and um, um, the changes in the manuscript took uh, one and a half years, so it uh, took very long time. And um, now it, it is published and we have uh, the second paper was just, uh, um, we got the decision uh, this night uh, that it is under minor revision. The third paper is under review. The fourth paper is submitted. The fifth six and seven is uh, going to be submitted during the summer. So um, yeah, that's the reason behind the only one accepted paper. I had to ask uh, and I have to comment on uh, how you write it in your thesis uh, where you then uh, also write manuscript intended for a specific journal, manuscript intended for, uh, again intended for, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, um, you can intend your your manuscript for science or nature. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah, um, I agree with you. And um, um, so you shouldn't write that. It's a manuscript. Okay. Yes. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. So as I said, that was the unpleasant part. Um, I would like to know how much you can actually generalize your work. You mean to apply it to uh, other materials? Exactly. Um, that's actually what I really want to try, uh, different materials. Uh, and I, I strongly believe that it can be interesting in many different research fields. Um, I have tried on other samples as well, and it works very well. So um, the acquisition of the 3D uh, FIBSEM data can be applied on other soft materials. You, you are now you're saying soft materials. What about mm -hmm. the hard, porous, poorly conductive materials? Mm. That's a very interesting question. So what like, would be a hard, porous, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. poorly conductive material? What would mm -hmm. that? That would uh, that would mean that we need to have, for example, 
higher uh, beam currents in order no, to... No, no, no. I mean, no? what material is that? What is a uh -huh. uh, poorly conducted uh, material? Okay, maybe I would say oxide. Yep. Ceramic. Yep. Mm -hmm. So highly uh, hard, porous, poorly conductive. Uh, you, you basically have soft, porous, poorly conductive. Mm -hmm. So now we make just a transition to hard materials. Yes. What? What? Uh, uh, how could you apply that technique you now have developed uh, on on uh, those type of materials? What? I'm thinking of just how that could, uh, so if, for example, if you have hard materials, um, you probably would need a higher current in order for, for the slicing procedure. Um, that might cause uh, charging effects, but then you have the charge neutralization using the carbon gas. So that might actually work. Um, it would be very uh, interesting to try it out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, charging is certainly a, a problem. Uh, um, iron or electron induced damage, most likely not. Uh, low uh, uh, contrast, would you have low contrast? Like you would have in your soft material? Um, I would say it depends on what you have in the oxide. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so. I'm of course asking that because we have worked with ceramic materials and we have looked into uh, porosity measurements, but we haven't mm. used uh, the FIPSEM, we have used X-ray microscopy. Mm. So very interesting discussion with the opponent. Uh, and uh, um, I, I would like to uh, hear from you, uh, as I say, what could you do uh, with your technique? Uh, we couldn't do... Uh, Otherwise, except for the, the resolution, but we use down to 50 nanometers. So your pore size, the smallest, smallest pore size you measured was, uh, as we heard, also 50 nanometers. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I said, I'm not an expert in, in, in the X-ray um, field, but um, in the FIB you can, for example, choose and select the area uh, of uh, where you want to acquire your 3D data. Um, that might be an advantage using the FIB. Um, well, you would use the FIB uh, to basically prepare the material for uh, the X-ray microscopy. So uh, yeah. that's not uh, uh, what I'm what I'm probably aiming for. I mean, uh, what uh, you also uh, have done is you have looked into transport uh, proper uh, problems uh, with your your channels and. Uh, um, your, your transport measurements. Mm -hmm. um, that's something which would actually be very interesting for like other materials as well. Uh, and uh, in, in those ceramics, uh, it's not necessarily transport uh, through the uh, porosity, which is of interest. It's actually also the transport, let's say, for example, heat through the actual material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So could, you, could you think of how your your uh, results could be uh, applied uh, in that respect. Uh, as I say, I would like to, to generalize a little bit more what you have achieved. Uh, oof, um, <laughs> um, I mean, if, 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 if you want to analyze the, 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 did you say heat transport in the, in the, um, so, um, and if you want to use the pores, um, yeah, then I come back to resolution, the resolution limit then, which is uh, then beneficial with the FIBSAM. But I mean, uh, what about the transport and uh, your, your channels and so on? Uh, is there anything uh, we could gain uh, from your type of results? Um, I mean, uh, we have then been able to characterize the porous network and uh, um, and you could then simulate the, the flow through the, the porous network. Um, maybe it's possible to use it also uh, with a um, X-ray tomography data if you have the porous structure. So um. hmm. 
we, we actually have uh, open and closed porosity because we don't have the leaching problem uh, as you mm. do. Mm. Um, but uh, I would also like to know how you can now apply your results for uh, design purposes. I mean, now you have uh, drug release coatings. What does that mean now? Mm -hmm. How can you, can you make use of uh, your results uh, in, in application? Yeah, so for example, now uh, we know that there are these larger solid regions in the coatings for, for example, HPC 22. And uh, for the low one with uh, closest to the permeability onset, and uh, that can then be used to, uh, for example, design the, the coatings now. Um, because if we uh, reduce the HPC content even further, um, the drug release is uh, re released. So um, we can now then um, both image and understand why we acquire these release rates and tailor the drug release. So would you rather go for uh, a more porous coating and make that uh, coating thicker if you want to have a longer type of drug re release or what would you, uh, what you do? Yeah, and also, uh, for example, consider the core diameter, uh, which mm -hmm. we noticed from our study that plays a very important role for the release rates. Um, and maybe not only change the coating thickness then, but also go with, for example, small cores um, or thick films because it has the slowest release rate. Hmm. I have one more question, and that was on this uh, palladium, uh, like uh, uh, Klaus was already uh, asking. You had done this uh, carbon tungsten or uh, platinum uh, uh, yep. coatings on top, protective mm -hmm. coatings on top. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, so I uh, tried out here then. Uh, I think you can see my screen here. Um, so uh, to the left here, you can see the, the palladium, only the palladium layer, and uh, that is not enough to reduce the curtaining effect, because I marked here. Um, and then uh, I also looked into depositing, so first I have palladium here, and then carbon, palladium and tungsten, and palladium and platinum. And for example, depending on what's, what you have in your material, uh, you can then select uh, for example, tungsten or platinum to uh, increase the contrast between uh, the protective layer and, and the, the sample. And this can be then beneficial for the segmentation part. So you can really tell like here is the interface between the, the sample and uh, the protective layer. Would have been uh, just the tungsten or just the palladium been uh, enough? Oh, uh, you, you, without the palladium, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I connect then back to uh, the class, uh, um, we get too much charging. Uh, mm -hmm. So if I only deposit without the palladium, I, uh, the, the whole sample is charging too much. So I need the palladium to reduce the charging as a first. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you, Professor Klemert. Uh, we have uh, also uh, Professor Martin Andersson here, maybe still. I don't know. Do we see you? Yes, I'm still He's alive. Still yes. yeah. <laughs> I'm just checking if you have some questions as well. Uh, before well, uh, we... yeah, I can have uh, a very brief. I uh, really enjoyed uh, your presentation, and I think it was a very interesting discussion. Um, so, as you mentioned here in your title, that uh, you're focusing on applications for drug release. And yeah. uh, can you hear me well or? Yeah, it was uh, lagging a bit though, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I was thinking a little bit with this uh, HPC because you did some release uh, studies. Yeah. HPC, right? Yes. Uh, and then you could see how much that were entrapped in the material. And in some cases you had quite a lot of uh, HPC that was remaining inside the structures. So if, if, if you then compare uh, what's being remained in the structure with the total volume uh, that you can measure based on the SEM images that you, that you get or the um, mm -hmm. tomography uh, reconstructions, um, 
what can you say about uh, uh, the correlation between these two? Uh, we talked about the voxel size and the resolution. Mm -hmm. So um, what is the match here between how much remains uh, in the material versus uh, your total volume here? Um, so, yeah, um, that would, um, that is a really good question. And uh, for example, as you, as you could see from, uh, um, okay, maybe I can zoom in here so you can see even better. So uh, for uh, this case, then when we have larger, vol larger solid regions, we can also see uh, according to the data you're referring to, that we have less uh, released HPC. And um, we uh, haven't made that study yet, um, but it will be very interesting to, to correlate exactly uh, how, uh, if we can see the total porosity versus uh, how much is leached. And um, that is also what I mentioned as future work, that would be really interesting to try to leach out these uh, cross sections then uh, to see if we can see where HPC is entrapped. Um, As a follow up of that, uh, <laughs> how, how big is your uh, HPC? I tried to find it somewhere, but I couldn't find it. Uh, oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, about that, um, I uh, I can't answer that. I'm. Um, you thinking of, of the? Yeah. Um, no, I'm. I can't answer that. The the only thing I know that it, you can you can purchase it in in, in various sizes. Uh, mm -hmm. It varies quite a lot. Uh, uh, of course, it, it can, uh, I mean, it's like a chain, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, you're able to, to penetrate. Uh, because uh, I was wondering a little bit, and uh, Reina was uh, on that uh, as well, uh, the porosity here. Uh, what is the porosity of, of the solid regions? Uh, it's not easy to, to yeah. say, uh, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't see the porosity. But mm -hmm. you could probably do it with the other techniques like... Uh, uh, nitrogen absorption or BET uh, and so on. But, uh, but that would be nice to see how, how that correlates uh, the total volume or if you're missing some, some pores uh, due to the resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, or do you see any, everything that is of interest, so to say? Yeah. Uh, just to, uh, I was interested to, to get your opinion. And uh, when I was reading this, it said that um, it should be noted that several pellets were studying using FibSAM images to ensure that the FibSAM were representative for the different types of film coatings. Yeah. So, so how many do you need to, to look at uh, to say that it's representative and, and, and how did you uh, come up with that number? Uh, also a very good question. Uh, it is more that I've been, uh, I want to, wanted to point out that I haven't just been looking into one pellet per per batch, um, I've been looking into, um, uh, I haven't counted all of them, but at least uh, 10, 10 to 20 pellets per sample. So uh, it's just, yeah, it is not just random uh, that the coatings look like this, because uh, they are, that's what I mean with representative. Because uh, what I was thinking is nicely here, uh, because in the title you have quantitative uh, reconstructioning, right? So if you mm -hmm. have them quantitative, then you could do statistics. If you start to get uh, a few numbers, mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. then maybe you can really show that they are representative by yeah. giving the numbers of the distributions, mm -hmm. uh, if there are. Yeah, okay. very good point. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining and for the questions. Thank you, Martin, and thanks uh, to the whole committee. So now we'll check if there are any questions from everybody who has listened to the YouTube broadcasts. There are no questions on, uh, on the chat, and I will now check if there are any questions to me on email.
And the answer is no. So with that, I will uh, uh, will uh, conclude this uh, public dissertation. Uh, thanks uh, everybody who has participated. Thanks everybody who has listened. And uh, we will now cut out the uh, YouTube uh, uh, broadcast and the thesis committee and the opponent and, uh, uh, and the uh, supervisor and the examiner uh, will uh, uh, will gather together to take a discussion and then a decision on, on the outcome of the thesis. Uh, and that decision will later be made available uh, on the website. Uh, on, on together with the YouTube uh, uh, movie showing the dissertation, as well as on the uh, the website of the of Evolson's group. Uh, I think that is it. So goodbye, everybody, and uh, thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs>